I'm here with the writer of Freaky, Michael Kennedy, Catherine Newton, who plays Millie, and uh, plays the Blissfield Butcher, Misha, Osh Misha Oshirovich, who plays Josh, and Celeste, work. who plays Nyla. <laughs> <laughs> so our first question um, for is for Catherine and Michael. How did you guys go about constructing Millie and the Butcher and sort of the differences between the two? Catherine. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can well, tell you from you know, the script stage. <laughs> I, it was all on the page. I think for me, uh, as an actor, I always kind of approach it from what's on the page and just kind of really dig into that. You know, everything a character says, there's a reason. Um, and we had an amazing actor um, named Vince Vaughn, and he <laughs> was incredible. And he had so many great ideas. Like, seriously, he came in with so many amazing ideas. Um, at first I thought that I'd be imitating Vince. Like I thought I was going to be doing like that kind of imitation game. But the truth is, is we created two characters together and we both played them. So we had rehearsals with our director, Chris Landon, one of the first couple days. And Chris would talk about Millie and who Millie was. And he has his own personal story. Cause we all kind of relate to Millie. Like everyone's been in high school and like not known who they are. and bullied maybe hopefully not but everyone goes through that where they kind of have to learn to be who they are and then use those things that they were probably made fun of to their advantage you know I was such a dork in middle school like and I'm still a dork for real my outfits are still weird you know like look at my shoes like what is she doing I love so <laughs> so Millie was easy right but then Vince also was playing Millie so when you start talking about who these characters are and what's on the page, it creates a physicality. And through that, we um, created like a foundation for how the butcher carries himself and walks and talks and all of these things that kind of put us all in sync. But without the script, like it probably would have been a lot more difficult. But I feel like from the very beginning, like everyone knew what the movie was. Like we were all on the same page because of the story that we were telling. And when that happens, you can just have a lot of fun on set and take a lot of risks, which is what you see in the movie. That's yeah. the beauty of writing it with the director. Um, when Chris and I were writing it, he knew, he knew already then and um, it was amazing watching him work on set, but he knew already when we were writing exactly how he wanted everything played. Um, it was easy writing scenes with him because he would, we, we beat the whole movie out, but then we would sit and discuss the scene and go, and as the director, he'd go, this is how I want this scene to play out. So that made it really easy to construct the characters. But I'm gonna give a tidbit that I don't think anyone knows that was the easiest thing for us as writers to know when it came to Millie and the Butcher, and you all read it in the script. But when the switch happens, we, and this was our POV on Millie and on the Butcher, for the whole movie script wise to the end of it we actually had a parenthetical after the body swap and it literally said um what did it say it i, I don't want to say it literally said because obviously i don't literally remember but it said something the effect like you, um we're going to call them by their brain names still even though they're in different bodies because millie's right. still millie and the butcher's still the butcher and for us, that was actually the, the easiest way for Chris and I to figure out who each person was in each scene, but also to, to like really start hammering home to people that identity was a major part of this film. If you notice when you watch the movie, Millie's always referred to as she and the butcher's always referred to as he. And that was another decision we made very early in the process because we knew how important it was. Those little things really do matter. And Chris and I, those are two things when we went in saying, this is going to be on the page saying this character still this character. It's Millie is Millie the whole time. It's just going to be a different body. And then the pronouns were a big part of it too. And I think that, for, I don't know about you guys, the actors, but I think that helps everyone understand what the movie is. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I, I literally, I rem literally remember that line in the script, and and it was, I mean, the script read really clear. I can't, I can't agree with what Catherine said enough. Like, it's all on the page. These two writers and our, our director knew exactly what they were going for. So we just, we were along <laughs> for the ride. It was so fun. They thought it could happen. Clearly, these two mad people thought that this movie would work out. I didn't know. <laughs> yeah, that's why they call it magic, though. I really feel like that sometimes. Like. When we it's first had the our, movie like, perfectly. 
yeah, there was like pictures of what the butcher's gonna look like, and there's pictures of Millie's room, and there's a cast. You see a picture of Misha and Celeste on a wall with all of us, and now we have a movie coming out. It's like we've created something out of thin air, and it actually works. So cool. Early, so fun. <laughs> Literally out of thin air. Now that's where the word literally works. <laughs> <laughs> um, for Misha and Celeste, was it sort of weird acting with two different actors playing the same role? Did you miss me? <laughs> no. Catherine. <laughs> <laughs> I um, miss Catherine definitely. Um, but it actually wasn't. It actually wasn't weird at all. Like Catherine was saying, because. Um, her and Vince worked together so well to like build these like really well rounded and developed characters. It like honestly didn't feel that different when it was Vince versus when it was Catherine. I mean, obviously like, yes, to a certain degree, but it definitely still felt like when we were in the moment in the scene that that truly was Millie. So just yeah. to tell you, Catherine's beautiful acting and Vince. <laughs> no, it's it. Yeah. I, I mean, even if, even as we've been doing all this press, like we kind of like we say things over and over again, but like it started to sink in for me and Celeste. Like it's really true. This the, Catherine and Vince rehearsed enough and were kind of creative enough that it never was laborious to believe that Vince was Catherine and vice versa. It was it was really easy, and I'm kind of shocked at how easy it was. Looking back on it, these two actors did such a good job that I'm like, oh, it was not effortful to believe that they were the butcher and Millie, and then switched. Exactly. Awesome. And Michael, I know you pitched this to Chris Landon, um, but you sort of did it as like a practice pitch. What was that like? Yeah. What was the overall pitching process like? So um, I happened to be having lunch with Chris like two days before I was going to actually piss it, piss it, pitch it to Ryan Turk at Blumhouse. Um, and I was just telling him about it. And Chris is so wonderful that he literally was just like, want to practice on me? And I, of course, was like dying inside because Chris became a friend, but before he was a friend, I really looked up to his career and his work and stuff. So I was like, oh my God, I'm literally getting like the teacher offering to get you ready to like take your SATs, you know? So he met me the very next day again, like who does that in LA, by the way? Wait, doesn't even wait 24 hours. And we got together and he was just like, this is weird for you to pitch to me because we're friends. So he's like, I'm just going to read your pages. I had a seven or eight page outline already at the time that I called Killer Body. Um, and it was a, a lot of the same beats already there. Millie, Nyla, and Josh were very much present. Um, but So I didn't actually have to pitch it to him, thank God, because I hate pitching. It makes me very nervous to do. So Chris sat on a couch, read my pages, and I sat at my computer and pretended to like fumble around on it while I was sitting there nervously waiting to see what Chris was gonna say. And I never went in with any intention thinking he would walk out of the room being my partner on this. But I heard him like laughing. And then I saw Chris, which I now learned he was doing these things with his fingers, which <gasps> yes, is like, yeah, it. which is like Chris being, that's Chris thinking. You can actually physically see him thinking because he does that when he's thinking. Um, and he started doing that. And I was like, hmm, I think he's, he, I think he likes this, you know? So then he like stood up and another thing Chris does is he starts walking back and forth when he's really excited and he starts pitching you stuff. And he does that to actors too. I think he did that to you guys at least once on the film and he just started throwing stuff at me like that's where the Aaron Rodgers mask came from um you know like he's like Millie should wear a mask but deconstruct the trope and have Millie wear the mask to hide out instead of the killer wearing the mask the rest of the movie um so we just kind of were like bouncing ideas off with each other and we both just kind of looked at each other and I was like inside dying because I wanted to ask him but I I also have respect people's time and like our relationship. I don't want to feel like I'm using anybody for anything. And he, I started kind of being like, do you want, and he's like, I want to make this my next movie. So Amazing. literally had to like brace myself with, to not like scream and was just like, oh, okay. Um, and was like, do you want to write it with me? Or are you just going to direct? That's what I said to him. And he goes, I want to write this with you, girl. So we were like, oh. 
yeah, he's like, let's sleep on it. Let's talk to our reps, see what they have to say. And he goes, sleep on it. You don't have to do this with me. It's such a good idea. I think you'll be able to do it on your own. Get somebody to buy it at least. Mm -hmm. And then within three hours, we were texting each other, like, what time do you want to start tomorrow? Like, it was just a no brainer. And we literally started the next day. Wow. Um, I didn't even know that whole story. Yeah. So like, we took my eight pages and just, what I call like gave it the land and heart and mm-hmm. really up the emotional stakes for the characters and pulled back the family element. Cause in the original pitch, it was very family oriented and Chris, the genius that he is, Nyla and Josh were there, but he's like, I really want to lean in this like trio of misfit toys and like make it about this trio. Yeah. He's like, because they're all so different and they are the teens of today. And like Josh was already queer. We were like, there's no way Nyla's not a black woman. Like, we really wanted these awesome kids. And so he just was like, all right, let's do this with the kids. So, like, we did that in, like, a week. It was nuts. It was so nuts. The whole process was nuts. But it's, and he gave it that land and charm. That um, just made me think about how you never see movies where it's really the kids. Like, yeah. a big movie, studio movie like this, there's always, um, obviously, we have our arc star Vince, which is amazing, but you, but he's with three kids. That doesn't happen. It's usually about the family or the, you know, the parents or something, right? Oh, wow. That's cool. Yeah. And we went in knowing to like certain things, like we didn't want to have a super hyper police procedural element. We didn't Mm want to have bumbling parents walking around going, what's happening? You know, like we wanted it really to be about the kids and their relationships with each other and how the three of them would really kill for each other. Um, And again, that's just what Chris does so well. He, you know, I, for me, the project came about because my father died and I was exploring grief in my own life and I wanted to put it on the page and I happened to be watching Happy Death Day one day and there's this beautiful moment with Tree and her mom and I started crying and I, in my tears, I said to myself, how do I rip this movie off? Wait, Michael, this is so sweet. Isn't this crazy? I I can't believe I never told you all this. So yeah, so then that night I was laying in bed at like two o'clock in the morning, couldn't fall asleep. And I was like, what's the movie? What's the movie? What's my Groundhog Day? What's my Groundhog Day? And I had an image of Lindsay Lohan and Jamie Lee Curtis flash in my head. And I was like, it's Freaky Friday. So I literally emailed myself this one line sentence saying, this is what the movie is. The dolo is in the sentence, by the way. And um, so I wouldn't forget. I was afraid I'd wake up in the morning and be like, what was that thought I had last night? Um, Real. That's kind God, of like the... I'd forgotten. Oh my God. No! Okay. <laughs> but then it sat for like a year because then I ended up selling a pilot to the CW and worked on that for like six months. So like that, there was like five emails in a row that night. And then I kind of put them in a drawer for like six months. Mm-hmm. Um, wow. And the pilot got passed on, which ended up being a blessing because this movie never would have happened if the pilot went forward. So. That's not fun. Isn't that crazy? Failure helps. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we have to believe that, right? We yeah. have to believe that. The Everything's best meant to, to be. Timing's everything. You know, Chris was just coming off a movie. He could have been shooting, you know, like it's, it's all time. You were all free to do the movie. And I, I can't imagine a movie see. without you. Oh my God. Speaking of timing, I literally like left the set of Ghostbusters and had one day at home. Like, I had one day to, like, reorganize my suit. You auditioned from set, didn't you? You did your tape yeah. from set? Yeah. 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 And the movie okay. wouldn't be what it is without you. The three of you. It, like, it just wouldn't be. Um, it's one of those lightning in a battle situations, if you ask me. Also, one of the easiest movies to film for some reason. I don't know why, but, like, we, it was a blast every day. <laughs> so right? I mean, I, I think that speaks so much to Chris, though. Like, like I mean, Absolutely. I think I think we can all agree. Chris is really good at like creating a family on set. So, like, going to set every day felt like going to not going to work, like going to kind of play with people that you already dig. It wasn't like it didn't feel like a job. Job. I mean, at five a.m. when we were all very caffeinated and cold, maybe. But um, <laughs> no, it, it was it, Chris well, really creates a family environment on set. So it was he so really fun. does, and I think the beauty of him too is he. He is the leader, but he also will hand the baton over and go run with it. Like, yeah. 
this is your movie as much as it is mine. And he was like that with everybody. And I think that was, this is my first experience on a set. So I think for you guys, you know more than me, but I just like Grizzly and Merrick and like all those people who had such a hand in the movie. Shout you know out know Grizzly! I mean? Grizzly! Best the best day ever. <laughs> like, Misha's right. It was Chris. Yeah. And Austin, I miss Austin. But anyway, I do too. Anyway, Whitney, 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 and Austin in our wardrobe department. Yes. The butcher wouldn't have had a red, red leather jacket without Whitney. That's we tried on a thousand leather jackets, and then she pulled this red one out. We were like, "Oh, really?" And she's like, "Yeah." I mean, I was like, really okay. Such an iconic look. And Catherine, you did have like a big role in that in creating the butcher's look, didn't you? Well. Michael wasn't originally the butcher in like a sexy outfit. Like I think we we had you in a dress. I want to say yeah, like it was written like a dress and heels. And I tried on that too. I tried on like sexy bustiers and stuff, and it looked great. It looked like a big transition, which is what we wanted was the big transition. But it didn't feel like something a dude would pick. <laughs> it just was like a dude's not gonna wear this to go kill people. And he's definitely not going to have his hair in his face. He's going to be efficient, which is so funny because like, it just tells it's like another thing about women and like how women dress and then how to be efficient. It's interesting. You know, women look breathless most of the time. We put a lot of work in, but it's just, we look breathless. Men just don't look like they try at all. So the butcher had to look like that. <laughs> and um, so it was fun creating that look. And I also really thought, you know, your dream is always that people will cosplay the butcher or like, I love like, I like going to conventions and like, I love anime and dressing up and stuff. So just as a fan, like, I thought that would be cool. And I thought it was an easy costume. Yeah, definitely. perhaps for someone. Yeah, to dress it's iconic. Up. Like, yeah. I hope so. You hope so. That'd be cool. Mm -hmm. And then for Michael, the film has a really interesting take on gender roles. Was there anything that you wanted to convey about gender? in general i think for me it's easily summed up as people should embrace their feminine and masculine and just have fun like be who you're going to be at all times and like don't let anyone take that away from you i spent half my life letting people do that to me in this movie to me is a complete celebration of humanity in a way like i love that we have these three kids here who just completely self-express and i wish every kid that for every kid because I didn't have it and I know a lot of queer kids that are watching gonna watch this movie don't. Um, yeah. So for me that was my main goal, like express yourself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Or Misha, you just had an interview in Variety about this, right? I did. <gasps> Ooh, Variety. Ooh. I, I mean, like that we talked about all kinds of shit in that interview, but it really steered and what ended up getting published was like you know horror is a queer space and or at least really? it can be. A yeah, and it, it can be, it can be both very empowering for queer people. And uh, Michael, I'm learning this as I go from folks like you, like Brian, like Chris, like I'm, like Sam. Um, I, horror can be so empowering for queer people. It also can be very detrimental when you have like the barrier gaze trope or like the, the, per, the character of color dies first trope. Um, so I, I love, and I'll say it till, you know, the day I die, which I hope is not very soon, um, that uh, Celeste and Mai's character really comment on through, through Michael and Chris's writing, we comment on the trope of the black character dying first, the gay character dying first. And it's, it's been, I don't know, I'm emotional because this has been a really kind of amazing sort of, I'm coming out as non-binary, I'm expressing that beautiful, amazing sort of freedom that I didn't have growing up. And this film is coming out with all kinds of queer empowerment attached to it. And it's, I think this is a really beautiful moment for a lot of Gen Zers who are like, God, like they, the ability to just express who you are is finally kind of the doors busted wide open so early for so many people. And I think films like this are a big part of that because people get to see themselves on screen and relate mm -hmm. to it. That's freaking amazing. I feel like it's really important for movies to be a reflection of the times. That's what they are. They're, they tell stories in all sorts of ways. You know, even if you go to like an action movie, like you're going to see something about the day that you're living in and Freaky just exploded in that. I mean, my favorite thing was going to the drive-in and hearing everybody's reactions immediately because I knew that the, mo that the movie was very forward, but also it didn't feel like that. Like, personally, for me, I felt like, duh, this is the movie, this is where we are right now, like, this is what should be in a movie. 
But then this tissue people like, flasher. what was that? This should be today's flasher. Yeah, like it's a no and it's such, yeah, hundred percent. And so to hear people saying and crying, there were people crying at the drive-in. Like I've never seen the character like this on screen, and you don't understand what it means for me. And it's like, you're yes. Thank you're welcome. <laughs> 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 just yeah. makes you feel like you did something more than just make a movie. Because for me, it's like I'm just playing a fun character, and you have no idea the impact it's going to have. So that's cool. Yeah, I just finished everything with so that's cool. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but also, like for me, like even for Nyla's character, like as a non-binary person, I was like so relieved that her character wasn't like hyper feminized. And like I know that like pants aren't like the epitome of like feminism, seeing a woman wearing pants. But also like even just like small things in the world like Millie and you as the butcher like we weren't really like super like sexualized or like feminized really as like women in the movie and I think that was like really comforting and like and progressive in its own way um, mm -hmm. yeah yeah, All our yeah. Movies, guys. All our <laughs> we did good <laughs> well, the thing I want to add to really quickly just about Nyla and Josh is that for Chris and I, it was really important that those two characters knew exactly who they were already. Um, we didn't want to, like, that's what I, the beauty of those two characters is they are who they are. You see that every second of the movie, neither of them waffle from that once. If anything, they go into overdrive on it to save their friend. And ultimately, Nyla and Josh are the heroes of the movie. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't, and I think most people are seeing that, and I think they're really surprised by it. And I think there's some people that are missing that because they're, yeah. you know, they're not, they're not seeing it a little bit. They need to go a little bit deeper in what they're seeing in a way. And I don't say that as a knock to anybody or anything, but like. I always have said since day one, and I've said this to Catherine and Vince and Misha and Celeste, like you're the four leads of the movie. There's not just two, like it's the four of you. And like, if you notice, the four of them are on screen the entire film. Like <laughs> everything Chris and I did with those four characters was very much on purpose. People always make fun of your friends. Well, not they always talk about how your real friends help you be who you are, you know, and the fake friends will like destroy you for being you. These mm -hmm. friends, will stop at nothing to make sure Millie is herself again. <laughs> <laughs> really? Stop at nothing. Real nothing. one. <laughs> so self-empowerment going off of that is like a really big theme throughout the entire movie. So why do you guys think that's an important message and what do you think it'll add to our, the horror space? Well, I think, I think horror as, again, I, like, as I'm learning is one of those genres where you can see yourself or see like, stories that you're very familiar with in a very heightened, fantastical, crazy situation, but you walk away with the lesson, like whether it's about mental health or identity like this film or gender, or, it, it's one of those genres where it, people can go and absorb a really funny, scary, kind, very kind of blasé film in that way. Like it feels very light killing aside, but then you walk away and you're like, oh shit, that's a real story about identity. And I know what it means to struggle that way, to feel like I'm at home in my body, in myself, in my high school self. So I think, I think in that way, it's a perfect kind of capsule for big messages and a really fun, accessible package, this film. Yeah, and I think to go off that really quick is like, we aren't preachy. Like, and I think that makes a big difference is that you're yeah. just, you're, in on the fun and you're in on the ride and then you go oh accidentally i just learned something you know like you in and like chris and i talked about that on this project and some of our own projects that we do separately about you know for lack of a better term like trojan horsing mm -hmm. the actual story behind the story you know what i mean like for me freaky is about a young girl going through grief who is keeping her family together by a thread and sacrificing her own identity in the process and has these two amazing friends who are already screaming to her, you're an amazing person, you are who you are, you don't need to be anybody for anybody else. Um, and the kills and the body swap are just like icing, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, to um, 
answer the question like along with what they were both saying i've always felt like this movie was about a girl who needed to see some, see herself from another perspective because she just didn't see it she didn't know her power and i think that everyone learns that you learn your power mm-hmm. but you know she had to be a serial killer to figure that out which is just very <laughs> traumatic it's casual it's casual it's 2020 anything's possible <laughs> Um, you guys used a lot of practical effects on this, which is a big favorite of the horror community. What were your favorite practical effects on set? Ooh, oh my left, gosh. <laughs> so left, were you there for a lot of it? I feel like your days were, we had a lot of killing days when you were off. Yeah. Does that no, make sense? I wasn't, I wasn't a part of the killing, but I did come to set to see the spoiler alert, Alan Ruck death. Um, yeah, <laughs> that was really scary. I also saw the prosthetics for like Ew. Uh, Magnus's head and like all like the boy and like Ezra's head that like <laughs> you know Mag- fucking Magnus. Him. I don't know if I'm allowed to curse, but like <laughs> like that because well, that's trauma for Misha right there. <laughs> right, look. It was late. It was 3 a.m. I was ill. We were screaming. It was, like it was 20 cold. Degrees. It was it so was, it cold. Was wet. And I'm doing a scene with Magnus, this actor, and then this actor, you know, gets Chris Landon. And but it, in fact, <laughs> it's in fact a full body cast. Uh, it's, it's all practical effects. It's full face, full body. It's gorgeous. And then you know, friggin' a hook goes through his eye, and I'm meant to react, and of course I react because it's scary um but it's disgusting yeah that was, yeah, that was my favorite slash least favorite slash most Mine dramatic was, thing. he was walking Ruck around well. with it in his eye was <laughs> it really i wasn't yeah. there that day i'm bummed now he was walking um, around with this thing in his eye and he was just trying to make talk like trying to talk to me i remember i remember we were at crafty and i just like slowly walked away <laughs> i was like you look weird <laughs> man like it's a little scary but what are you gonna do it's a horror film we signed up for this. <laughs> My favorite is the Ruck kill as well, but only because after doing it, there was like they put like these plastic tarps all around the set to protect the rest of the set from having to be cleaned for hours on end to, in case they needed to shoot it again. <laughs> but it went oh, the blood was so high it went over the tarp and like got all <laughs> over the. It was an actual shop classroom and an actual, we shot in all practical locations. None of them were sets, except maybe like one or two locations. And I, I was walking by it and it was just like giddy, 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 like taking pictures of it with my phone, like, cause I wanted to show Brian this blood. And then I just hear this crew member behind me go, how the fuck did blood get over there? <laughs> <laughs> and I was dying. It was so funny, and he said it in such a way that was hilarious, and then he started laughing. But also, like Misha said, it was like 2 o'clock in the morning, like, close to Halloween. It was just so, that's when I realized, I was like, holy shit, they're making something that I wrote, and it involved, like, geyser of blood. It's so great. (laughs) Yeah. Um, And did this experience make you guys want to do more horror films in the future? Yeah, I love horror films. They're so fun to make. I've talked about this before, but I feel like a horror film is a different kind of acting. Like, you can do a lot more without talking, and you can just use your physicality to tell the story. I love how the audience is, like, it's almost like an interactive kind of movie. Because you always kind of know what could happen, because you knew you signed up to get scared, so you're prepared to get scared at any time. And as an actor, you can, like, think about those things, and it's really fun and it's fun to be scared on set because you kind of laugh the whole time too honestly yeah it wasn't I'm like not a huge fan of the of the horror genre at least I wasn't before this and I was like how is it going to be on set and like I actually I honestly like was not scared on set like I was like I mean I did avoid a lot of the uh blood and murder (laughs) that was happening um but (laughs) like but still it was just like actually such a fun experience and made me be like hmm, okay maybe i could give this this another shot <laughs> you're, very, you're very good in it so i hope you do <laughs> also the fandom of a horror film you know yeah. die hard so it's cool to be a part of that kind of community that's so strong it's a big oh deal 
Brian of uh, Nyla and Joshua today was so cute. One of you posted it on your Instagram. It was the cutest thing. And like fan art already. Fan posters. Catherine, you've had a ton of drawings of you as the butcher. It's so cute. Can you send them to us? I want to see. Yeah. I think a lot of them are like saved in my stories, but I'll send them to you. I'm doing another horror film, by the way. Sign me up for another horror film. Sounds fun. Yes. I am. Um, Okay, we'll talk about that. Yeah, we'll talk about it. It's supposed to shoot in the spring. I can't really say anything other than that until they announce it. It's oh supposed to shoot next spring. And it's another, the way I could put it, it's another, I, I meld the slasher with another high concept movie from the 80s. Because <laughs> apparently that's all I know how to do. <laughs> if it works. <laughs> yeah, don't, don't fix it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's amazing. Um, what do you hope people will take away from Freaky? Hope that everyone just has a good time and can laugh because that's what everyone needs right now. It's been a hard time for everybody. And I hope that this movie just gives you that break that everyone deserves. Yep. Yeah, very bad. <laughs> have a good time. Just have a good time. <laughs> oh, it's good old time. <laughs> I, yeah. I will add to that and say, have a good time. I want everyone to have a really good time, but I really want, um, 16 year old me so kids struggling and depressed and sad to really feel seen i'm really gonna cry it's like we didn't get that as kids and it's really it's really beautiful to be able to present this type of movie to a generation that get you know like a generation of kids that could feel seen and if some kids feel seen because of our movie that will be the greatest part of this for me I mean, oh. I, like, I just cry. <laughs> we need that right now. I mean, the, like, there's movies I remember growing up in that have stuck with me and really become a part of who I am, like a part of growing up. Uh, yeah. It's changed me. And I did feel like freaky. It could be that for some people. So, yeah. like, that's what I feel like, like what you're saying, right, Michael? Like, you hope yeah. that it does that for people. I, hope so I, I survived on movies like Scream and Scream 2 and watching someone like Sidney Prescott thrive, um, <laughs> you know, and for me, the greatest experience of all of this is creating Joshua. Um, and Aww. because we didn't, we put ourselves in Sydney's and we put ourselves in the Nancy Thompson's and it's amazing for the Nylas and the Joshes of the world to see Nyla and Josh. Um, I think Misha's crying too. <laughs> it makes me so happy. It's the greatest moment of this, and I know it is for Chris too because we discussed it a lot. Like, we wanted to create a character. We talked about how we didn't have a character like Joshua or Nyla growing up, um, and to be played by actors like them growing up. Yeah. Um, midway through the script, we were like, "Oh, wait a minute, we're doing it," <laughs> and it's like the most, and it's so fulfilling. I love it so much, mm-hmm. um, and I love these these three kids. We love you. We love Thank you. you. <laughs> Thank you for this movie, Michael. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Wouldn't happen without you. Thank, thank Chris. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. The biggest thing. You that. Or your biggest takeaway from making the movie. Your biggest takeaway from making the movie. Mm-hmm. Mm. These people. <laughs> yeah. I All think so. so uh, I think it is these people. Yeah, I agree. I said that to Brian last night after we watched the movie. I said I never in a, ma- a million years would imagine that I'd be friends with the cast from the film. And not a knock on me. It was before I met any of you. I was, I just, it never occurred to me that it could happen. It's, I think the, the other thing to take away from it is that you can't really dream big enough. Because I could have never thought of a movie like this. Like, you could ask me my dreams and goals, but this probably wouldn't have been on it and it's better than a dream it was that for me so that you got to dream big and then get get it and it'll be even better <laughs> what were you gonna say um i forget now but yeah no. I, <laughs> no, 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 I definitely i definitely think that that my biggest takeaway is all of you guys like the the like friendships that we have like i don't also did not think that I would be friends with the writer of the movie either and I never thought I would be part of a movie like this especially like horror and comedy and how like crazy and like insane and fun it is like I just like 
I literally was looking through like the photos um, the other day of all of us on set. And like, there's this one photo, I know you guys know what I'm talking about. It was the night that we were um, filming the final fight scene. And it was like, it was like 6 a.m. <gasps> or like 7 a.m. And we were all like huddled in like a little like ball. <laughs> and you had like blood splatter on your face and we we're like looking up, like smiling. We gotta <laughs> post that. <laughs> oh yes, no, we have a lot of we have a lot of good behind the scenes content, but I miss you guys. Bankable. So <laughs> I know I need to post all of it like now. I know. Once the movie comes out, everyone's gonna be like, Catherine, stop posting about Freaky. <laughs> 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 so I have to do no, it. Right then, now. then we'll after we stop posting, we'll then start pestering Jason Blum to let us do part two. I know. Somebody was like in an interview, someone was like, oh, would you, like, do a sequel? I was like, um, yeah. yes. Tomorrow. <laughs> Literally yesterday. Would do Tomorrow, it. yeah. Yesterday. I just want to be the butcher again. Like, I want to be the butcher again. I want to swap. I want to swap a body. I don't really care who it is. I'm voting for Celeste, but I want to swap a body. <laughs> I like swap. I'm, that would be, like, Chris a and I, Chris and I have ideas. It's on your side. Oh, I love it. <laughs> that. that would be so funny. Wow. Freakier is what I want to call it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Celeste. I love that. Oh my god. <laughs> All right. Well, <laughs> a great place to wrap up. Where can people find you on social media? Catherine Newton. Instagram, Twitter. I think that's all I have. <laughs> TikTok. Don't you have TikTok? Yeah, and my TikTok is also Catherine Newton. I'm posting some fire TikTok, some real fire content. Are you though? <laughs> Are you though? I feel like if you're actually doing that, you don't have to say they're fire. <laughs> no, they're pretty horrible. They're really bad. I that's just key. really wish I knew how to make a TikTok. <laughs> oh, you're better than me. I don't even have one. I'm I'm Misha Osharovich on Instagram and Twitter. I'm Celeste underscore O'Connor on Instagram and Celeste O'Con on Twitter. I don't really use Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Michael Ken Ken on Twitter and Michael TJ Kennedy on Instagram. Ken Ken. Michael Ken Ken. I, Michael Ken Ken. I started my Instagram on set, remember? Oh my God. Nice. Yes. Wait, that's so true because I remember being like, um, Michael, you don't have an Instagram. You need <laughs> I felt really old in that moment. I was and like, like, we really, really bullied you into getting an Instagram because we took cute pictures that we wanted you to post. My first three photos are with one of each of you. Yeah. They're really cute, well too. Yeah, they're really cute photos. Because we bullied you. Yeah. <laughs> you did bully me. You definitely bullied me into it. But now I'm obsessed with it. And everyone can see my dog post. Oh my god, yeah. Well, your dog is the real star. Scooby is the real star of yeah. everybody's Instagram. Yeah. I mean, right? Scooby is a result of this movie. Did you know that? No. Yeah. So That's Scooby cool. was Brian and my boyfriend Brian and I always wanted to get a dog, but we just didn't feel right getting a puppy with one of us not home working. We wanted to like really care for the dog. Um so when I sold the movie, I was actually working a full time job. And the movie opened up the door for me to my second film and all this stuff. So I was able to quit. I was able to pursue screenwriting full time. And as a result of that, Scooby was a Christmas present. So like oh. Scooby happened because of Freaky. Isn't that crazy? That's no, I didn't know that. Freaky dog. Yeah. So we got her in January right after we were back from filming in the holidays and stuff. Yes, it looks so cute. I remember mm -hmm. you telling us you were going to get a dog. I was like, oh my god, big step. Uh -huh. and did you know I quit my job on set? <laughs> no. I gave my two weeks notice while I was at, while I was in Atlanta on set one day. <laughs> so you remember when I had to go back for a couple weeks? I had to go back to finish work and then go <gasps> back. Then I came back to you guys. Wow, 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 wow. Power move. You Isn't like, that funny? My, 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 I worked at a TV show. Everyone there was so great and supportive. They were the ones that were like, go to set for three weeks. We'll give you time off. Like, they made it really happen. And they were so excited Amazing. for me when I called. Yeah. When I called, they were like, we knew it. We knew this was going to happen while you were away. So, yeah, it was pretty cool. That's so funny. I'm so happy that you, like, actually got to hang out on set, though. So am I. Such a life-changing experience. Yes. And for more freaky content, 
<laughs> Is you a fan of Gloria.com? I need mine. A ton of behind the scenes. I need one. It's great. <laughs> it's great. All Thanks, right, Corey. thank you guys so much. Thank you, you, Corey. Thank you, Fangoria. Yes, yeah. thank you, Fangoria. Thank you, Universal. <laughs> Thanks, guys.